So when the dark came, it made them afraid. They gave their fear a name. The Night Beast. How's it going, VR Toronto? Today I'm going to talk to you a little bit about the work we did on Star Trek's Short Treks. Basically how we moved from a traditional VFX pipeline over to a real-time Unreal pipeline. So just a little bit about myself. My name's Asad. I'm the lead Unreal artist at our Pixamato Toronto branch. And luckily enough, I have the chance to art direct for this particular short that I'm going to talk to you about today. So at Pixmondo, we're primarily a visual effects house. You can see some of the previous work that the team's done. Uh, you might recognize ILM's work on The Mandalorian, where they used an LED volume for real-time onset uh, digital environments, which I'll touch on in the end. But uh, right now, I want to focus on this. So I'll just dive right in with our core pipeline. First thing we needed to figure out was our version control, which we found uh, perfect for us was Helix Core's Perforce. The benefit of this was it was super easy to pick up. It was great to get up and running as fast as possible for our traditional VFX artists. Uh, myself included found it very uh, quick to pick up and it was just great for collaboration. We had about 90 shots to get through, so there were a lot of cameras that we needed to get over from Maya into Unreal. Now to do that, we started on the export side from Maya with a Maya script written in Python, which essentially accounts for any access changes that you would have to make to your camera to get it from the Maya system to the Unreal system. And it would bake out any filmback settings, any focal length changes into keyframes, at which point it could export that camera as an FBX. Now on the import side, we had written by our own Malcolm Dobis, a Blutility slash Python script. So it's a mix of the two. And what this basically does is it's a catch-all script you can see here, where we could select our shot, task, and version, and hit import. So depending on the task that we have selected, if it's a match move, for example, it'll import our camera for us. Now what this will do is find the FBX that we exported from the Maya side, and make a sequencer for us. This sequencer will have the frame range uh, included, the frame rate included, a spawnable camera would be created, and a camera cut track would be created, to which the camera would be assigned. So this took out a lot of the legwork early on that we would need to do and sped up the process for us quite a bit. On the animation side, early days we explored Alembics in Unreal. So there are two methods of importing Alembics in Unreal. You have skeletal imports and you have geometry cache imports. With skeletal imports, we found a few bugs with jittery normals, where they would occasionally flip or wiggle. On the geometry cache import side, that issue was resolved. However, upon rendering these frames, we found that the cache itself would occasionally jump a frame or jump back a few frames. So to circumvent all of this, we went with an FBX pipeline, the tried and true method that's in a completely finished state but the only caveat that we found with it was keeping our rigs consistently Unreal compatible. So moving from traditional VFX to sort of game engine rigs was one of the biggest jumps that we had to make. So this is just an example of the import script, or rather the export script that we had for our animations. What this script would do is essentially you could select your character and it would find all the bits and pieces that you would need for your animation. So in this case, it would grab all the bones that are skinned to your geometry. Only select those bones, bake all the animation out, and save that as an FBX. So we'd have a lighter FBX file because we're not including the actual geometry in it. And on the engine side, we could simply import this and assign it to an existing skeleton in engine that we've imported beforehand. On the import side, we're using that same catch-all script that we saw earlier with the camera. So again, based on the context, so the task, it would import your animations for you. Now, as for shaders, we have close to the traditional system where you would have a node graph you'd start with and all your parameter changes you could make in an instance of that material, that node graph. What we've added on top is a master instance. So just to give you a clearer understanding of what that entails, we would start with our material instance and these would propagate to the master. So if we wanted to version up these materials, what we could do is simply swap out these two assets, which are a parent of this, and then all those changes will propagate to this master asset that we see here. And then from this master asset, all those changes will propagate to the assets that it's assigned to. Now, the reason we did this and not exclusively version control through Perforce was that we wanted to have access to all our shaders on hand 
uh, just like on the fly. If we have dailies going on or a client review or something, and we want to be able to switch between a bunch of shaders very quickly, view them in different contexts, uh, this would be the way to go. Just having them on hand all the time is great for just ease of life with this project. So this is the system we went with to keep that organized as possible. As for environments, we had sort of a similar system with this layer of separation that we see here between one asset and essentially a duplicate of that asset. So the reason behind this is uh, with our working level, this is what our artists would actually work on. And then all the changes the artists make would then be propagated at the end of the day to the master level. And this section would be done manually. So the only reason for this is if we have two artists working on one environment simultaneously and they want to propagate those changes to any version control software that we might be using, you could run into a conflict if you're working on the same U asset. So the reason we have this working level is to make sure no one's working on the same U asset at the same time. And this way we avoid any conflicts. And then from there, once all those changes are propagated to the master level, this master level can be streamed into our layout task, which is where all the animation will get laid out and imported from Maya, and into our lighting task, where all the lighting takes place. One big benefit that we had with environments was once they're laid out in Unreal, which for every environment we did, uh, if we wanted to place a million rocks in there, Unreal could handle all that geo because it's great at handling instancing. Now, when we wanted to import these environments to Maya to hand off to our layout department or our anim department, uh, all this instancing would be maintained in Unreal's built-in FBX system, which was a huge help for us. So the benefit of that was if we had this environment with a million rocks brought into Maya, all these rocks wouldn't bog down the Maya viewport, same way they wouldn't bog down the Unreal viewport, because Maya would recognize the instancing and Unreal would mark it as an instance. Just to touch on the rig system that we had in place, uh, initially we would update our rigs by re-importing the FBX and replacing it with an updated FBX. However, we found if there were major hierarchical changes to this rig, uh, this could break the skeleton in the U asset, or it could break any previous animations that were imported. So the way we circumvented this was by housing all our rigs in a blueprint. We would call this our master blueprint. And this would be our way of publishing these rigs. So what the benefit of this would be is uh, if we wanted to add features at a root level to the rigs that you could add to any blueprint, we could do that and it would propagate throughout all the shots. The other major benefit that we found with this was if we wanted to use a legacy rig on a per shot basis, so just for a certain shot, we could do so in the details panel of the blueprint by just swapping out the skeletal mesh. So this way we could house all the versions of our rigs in engine simultaneously and flip between those on the fly. And just to briefly touch on our facial rigs, we used bone driven facial rigs for this particular short. One benefit of this was uh, one, lighter file sizes, so there's no blend shapes being imported. And two, uh, we would have a lot of granular control for the animators, which was a big benefit for a stylized short like this, where you want a lot of exaggerated expressions, so you'd need that kind of control. As for lighting and rendering, this is the final step in the process, so everything's going to funnel into this. We saw earlier we have our layout level and environment level. Uh, these master levels would then be referenced into our lighting level, or in Unreal speak, they would be streamed into our lighting level. Sequencers were also referenced from task to task, so what I mean by that is this is sort of our uh, whole sequencer system laid out. Now, we saw earlier we import our camera sequence, uh, just with the script, and on our main line here we can see that camera sequence gets imported as a shot track into our layout sequence. So this is where all the animation would be laid out, uh, all the blocking of the cameras would be there. And then this, uh, which houses the camera sequence, would be imported as a shot track into the lighting sequence, which is the final step. And we can see over here, these also branch off. If we have multiple artists working on the same sequence, they could have their own working file and those changes we could roll into the master file. Again, this is to avoid conflicts with the version control. Onto some tidbits, some tips and tricks that we learned throughout the process. 
we used the dither temporal AA trick quite a bit. Uh, this was to avoid any Z fighting issues that we would get with other translucency methods, uh, any occlusion issues that we might get with those as well. And it's just the way that it interacts with the light is similar to opaque materials, which interact really well with the light. So we wanted to stick to this as much as possible. And you can see here how that dithered effect kind of works. Feigns the soft fall off using the dithering. So we use that quite a bit, but we found caveat with that was a lot of ghosting we would encounter. So if, especially with emissive materials going in front of a dither temporal AA material, we would get a lot of ghosting, this onion peel effect here. So we avoided that with a few console command tweaks of the temporal anti-aliasing uh, method in Unreal. And the main one being the amount of temporal anti-aliasing. So if we had too much temporal AA, we would get the ghosting. If we had too little, we would get the jittery effect of having no aliasing at all. So the way we circumvented that was with these settings. That's what we landed on. And I pretty much use this in every single project that I start now. So to touch on the hair as well, this was simply imported as Geo, uh, converted from XGen in Maya, and imported as essentially a bunch of tiny, tiny cards into Unreal. So this was before Unreal's Groom system, and it worked uh, quite well. Unreal handles uh, the 5 million triangles that make up this hair super well. Uh, it runs pretty fast in the viewport. Uh, if, however, it did not in a particular heavy scene, uh, we could switch this off in the blueprint uh, for the rig. Quick lighting trick that we found was lowering the shadow resolution to fake soft shadowing. Now, this would be the case if we're using an alembic, so we don't have any capsule shadowing available. We weren't using ray tracing for this particular short either, so we found that this was a nice little hack, depending on the shot, that uh, ended up working quite well in the final short. Onto some specific effects that we found with some shaders. We started with, early on in the short, this dying wheat effect. So we could see this crow is sweeping over the land and the wheat dies. This was simply accomplished by taking the living wheat shader, having an overlay of a dark color on top of that, creating a world space mask to flip between the living wheat and the dead wheat shader, and on top of all that, adding a vertex offset to push the wheat down over time. So it sort of looks like it's crumpling in on itself. Onto the night beast effect, we wanted a dark wave uh, behind the beast at all times, and it needed to be sort of thick, cloudy, ethereal, and we needed it to interact with the lighting really well. So this is where the dither temporal AA technique came in handy. So we started with this uh, piece of geo that came out of Houdini from our effects department, and this has essentially a wave rippling through it. So thank you, Jinsung, for that. And essentially what we would do is we wanted to get rid of this silhouette here, this hard edge around the geometry that's a dead giveaway for um, any fake volumetrics that use geometry. So first off, we would stamp this piece of geo, this wave, throughout our scene uh, on a per shot basis, and then we would use a Fresnel effect um, to mask between an opaque front-facing geo and a completely transparent side-facing geo. So we would get a nice fall-off between the edges of the mesh and the front of the mesh from like a completely translucent to an opaque. So this really helped fake the volumetric thick cloudy effect that we were going for. The starburst sequence that we went with also used a very similar effect. So we have the same Fresnel effect going on here. In this case, we could get away with using a traditional translucent shader as opposed to the dither temporal AA method just because this is completely emissive, so we don't need it interacting with any lighting, we just needed to emit light. And on top of all that, we added a panner to get this additional movement in the clouds. Now what uh, this actual geo looks like over here, you can see it's a series of tubes, also some funnels that have more rippling effects going through them, and that really helped sell the effect for us by adding that extra layer of movement to it. And just to briefly wrap up, our holograms also used a very similar method. Uh, we have the same Fresnel effect going on for these. Again, with these, we could use the emissive, therefore translucent additive material. And it was much simpler than the Night Beast effect for us. 
So just to wrap it up for you guys, down the pipe, what we're looking at at Pixo is a full pre, mid, and post-production solution in Unreal. So on the pre-production side, we traditionally rendered all our previs in a Maya viewport. Now we can utilize Unreal's lighting and rendering capabilities to get that much closer to our final shots from the get-go. As a bonus, you can get everyone who'll be on set that much more excited before shooting. For virtual scouting, we can hand a DP or director our VR scouting toolkit and have them do any blocking or lighting in a fun way to plan out their shoot. They can decide what'll be practical, what'll be digital, and basically plan out their shoots that much more efficiently, well in advance. On the production side, which we saw in The Mandalorian, we have the LED volume, where you would have live on-set backgrounds as opposed to a green screen. Pixamondo, in collaboration with APG and CERT, has built one of our own right here in Toronto. So you can see an early version of it up on the screen here. On the post-production side, we're looking at full CG animation, which we just saw today, as well as VFX and plate integration, which we actually saw a little bit of in Star Trek Discovery Season 1. So that's a little glimpse into what's down the road for us and how we went about tackling our first full CG Unreal short at Pixamondo. So thank you for listening, VRTO, and can't wait to see what's in store next year. I'll see you guys in the Q&A.